Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and each week I meet with military veterans to learn about their civilian career, what they do, how they got there, and advice for other veterans seeking to do the same. Today's episode number 296 with David Wallace. I hope this doesn't come off uh, too strong, but uh, you're not owed anything. Mm. Uh, you know, you serve a country, that's great, but every company is trying to find the best uh, candidate. And just because you've served and you've had that experience with that thing doesn't necessarily mean that you're the best candidate. So you need to be humble. You need to be able to uh, understand that, you know, there actually might be somebody better. Uh, and be prepared for that because um, rejection is hard when, uh, you know, you have, say you have 800 people applying for that one position. David transitioned from the military twice. He talks about what he got wrong in his first transition and advice on pitfalls to avoid. He now leads a team of five people at Lockheed Martin, which organizes over 170 career fairs per year and has helped countless military veterans in their career search. We cover a lot of ground in terms of resources that veterans should consider, mistakes to avoid, and more. As always at beyondtheuniform.org, In the show notes for the episodes, we list all resources discussed, and there are a lot of them for today's episode, as well as a text transcript thanks to Kathleen Dillon. Special thanks to all of you who have left positive reviews on Apple Podcasts. I wanted to call out username out in 2017. Hope that went well. Out in 2017 said, "Great, great resource for transitioning service members. I feel that Justin does a great job of asking pertinent questions that provide value to the listener. Keep it up. Thank you, and all 112 of you have left positive reviews. So with that, let's dive in to my conversation with David. Well, joining me today in Washington, D.C., my guest is David Wallace. David, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Well, uh, welcome uh, yourself. Uh, you know, I really appreciate you coming to my home office. Uh, so uh, thank you for giving me the time to be part of this uh, wonderful opportunity to talk about uh, what uh, I do with uh, Lockheed Martin. Awesome. Well, uh, for listeners, I want to give a quick background on David. He is a military relations project manager at Lockheed Martin, where he's worked since 2009. He served in the Navy for over 20 years, first as a Navy photographer on the USS Fulton, the USS Forrestal, and then became a Navy Reserve career recruiter. recruiter. Um, So maybe, David, just to set uh, the stage for things, could you take us through your transition from the Navy and what that initial job search was like? Yeah, actually, you know, I had a, um, I know a lot of people say they have a unique transition experience, but I actually transitioned twice. Uh, I got out the first time uh, in 1996 uh, thinking that I was going to be the next uh, Ansel Adams with my photography skills. And uh, long story short, it didn't work out. But thank goodness I had a backup plan with uh, uh, having an application in to become a uh, Navy reservist on active duty for the career canvasser program. And I became a recruiter uh, for the last 13 plus years of uh, my military career. So when I got out the first time, I was nowhere near uh, ready to get out. There was a lot of things I had learned from there. And the second time I got out, uh, obviously it worked rather well. Uh, I was more prepared. I had a lot of great things I remember from my first experience that truly helped me be successful in my uh, final transition into uh, a civilian career. What, uh, that, that's great to hear. I didn't realize there were those two transitions. And I'm wondering for listeners who um, might be on active duty approaching their first transition, what advice would you have for them or what mistakes could they avoid in that? Well, you know, uh, the transition class, the TAP class uh, that most people uh, think of it as uh, has changed a lot, not only since I got out in 2009, but even prior to that, Uh, They didn't actually start the TAP class until uh, 1999. So when I got out in 96, it wasn't much. It was, Mm -hmm. hey, here's a couple, you know, here's how to do a resume. Uh, Come to this class. Here's some benefits. And here's some employers that you can talk to. It wasn't as in-depth as uh, how it's uh, changed and evolved uh, since then. Uh, I think probably the biggest thing to 
uh, make sure that you have is um, knowing what you want to be. You know, what I always call what you want to be when you grow up. Mm-hmm. Uh, knowing exactly uh, uh, the field that you want to do. Because, you know, there's a lot of hats that we've worn in the military. So you really need to kind of uh, write down on a piece of paper all the things that you enjoyed doing, the things that you did not, and typically those that uh, line up with what uh, you enjoy doing is probably the area of development that you want to do for when you go into uh, a civilian career and start looking at what, uh, if there's any certifications or anything like that that you need to have to be ready. Um, You know, the sooner... The sooner you plan, the better you're going to be. Don't think that this is going to happen, you know, your last three months and it's an overnight, going to be an overnight success. Uh, when you're actually transitioning, that uh, a transition process is technically another full-time job because there's a lot of different things that you have to prepare for. That's great. And um, I'm wondering... Sorry, just taking a quick note on that. I, I like that thought of just kind of writing down the things you enjoy, the things you don't enjoy, and using that to start that process. And I, I also like how you're talking about it is a full-time job. And I think a lot of people underestimate the amount of time and energy it takes to find a fulfilling career. So I love that you're giving it the space to, to occupy that. Of like, this, is gonna, this could take a, a while. What was it that, that led you to Lockheed Martin? Uh, well, my transition manager, uh, when I was getting out the second time, Lockheed Martin was just opening their, uh, or had just opened their Center of Leadership Excellence uh, in Bethesda, Maryland, and they had an opportunity for local uh, transitional service members to come, and uh, they had an initiative for helping people um, with their resumes, resume writing, and networking, and just trying to get a feel for uh, what the transition process is like. It wasn't really a meant to be for a job uh, opportunity, a career opportunity, but I ended up going there. It was my first day of uh, transitional leave, and uh, I ran into the regional recruiting director at the time, uh, Mike Byrne, and uh, we started talking, and next thing you know, he was sitting down with me, and I got an interview uh, on the spot. Uh, you, know, cause, you know, he asked me a couple questions. I was prepared. I said, hey, you know, I understand you have a military recruiting team, and, uh, you know, I know that you, I noticed you don't have anybody in the capital region, and I know the capital region like the back of my hand, so maybe I could help your team out. It sounds like something I would be really good at. And that evolved with a job offer three weeks later. Mm. I... That, that's really incredible. I love this thought of, of knowing your strengths, knowing that you had the network and the, the command of that area, and then almost like giving them the position to fill with you. Like you're, you're, like you're seeing an opportunity. It's not, um, it's not the typical story I hear where it's like, oh, I saw this job post, I applied, but it's really seeing like, hey, there's, it seems like you have a need here. This is how my background lends itself to filling that need, and maybe we could work together. That's, that's pretty incredible. Well, that, that's something that some people don't know. Sometimes it's all about, and this isn't uh, being braggadocious on my, on my part. This is stuff that I do for a living uh, within Lockheed. Um, I believe that uh, you, know, you present yourself well, and uh, an opportunity can come knocking. You never know who it's going to be. Uh, I just happened to be at the right place, the right time, and met the right person. And, you know, uh, all three oper- career uh, positions I've had within Lockheed Martin have actually been positions that have never been created before. Hmm. So uh, that's very unique. Um, but, uh, and that happens from time to time. Um, sometimes you may not even know what you are looking for when uh, you're out there. You know, they call a recruiter five different things. They call a lot of different skill sets something that you may not be used to hearing. So, you know, be, being knowledgeable of how to do that personal branding statement, you know, your, your commercial, your elevator pitch, whatever people want to call it nowadays, um, is very important. You need to be ready. Uh, you need to be able to know and feel comfortable with talking to people and uh, being inquisitive. Mm-hmm. You know, asking the individual, hey, you know, here's my skill set. Is there something in your company that uh, might be um, something of interest? Uh, or, you know, can you point me in, a, in the right direction? 
not just saying, hey, you know, have you got a job for me? Uh, that's uh, one thing that'll turn off any recruiter. So you need to be able to word it in a way where um, you're just, you're acting more as interviewing them and trying to identify um, things that's going to help you uh, and how you can show how you can help them. Mm. I love that. And I, I would just point out for listeners that, that um, David talked about being in the right place at the right time. But I think the thing going on in the background is, is he was prepared. He was ready. He had thought through where he was uh, strong, what he had to offer. He, he knew how to position it. And so I'm imagining, you know, in these, these cases he's pointing to, it worked out. But I'm sure there's a million times where he was practicing, where he was able to, to just talk with people and share more about what he was looking for and what he was interested in. And over time, that led to some incredible opportunities. But I, I really want to point out the, um, what, what you said, David. I love that thought of like thinking of that personal branding statement, having that ready, having that on the tip of your tongue, and not just saying, you know, do you have a job? I think that makes such an incredible difference. And I was wondering if you have any advice on how to, 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 to form that personal branding statement. Uh, well, you know, they teach in uh, tap class, you know, you want to you want to be able to you know, say, hey, you know, hello, my name is, um, you know, add something along the line of, you know, these are my skill sets. Uh, and you can word it a, di- a couple different ways. Uh, and then at the very end, just saying, is this something that might be of interest within your company? Um, I don't want to like go fully in depth in the in the complete how because you don't want to sound robotic. So I don't want people to be the Dave Wallace way. Um, you know, you, uh, everybody learns differently on how to produce that uh, personal branding elevator pitch segment. And it does take time, as you said. You know, the, the easiest way to get used to figuring out how to uh, come up with that statement is going to a career fair and going around to the different tables, whether you're interested in, in them or not, or just inquiring. The more practice, as you alluded to earlier, the easier it is for it to come off the tip of your tongue and not sound robotic and coming off with um, a very smart way of uh, promoting yourself. That's great. That's great. And I love that thought of the authenticity, not, not doing the Dave Wallace way, but finding a way that resonates with each unique listener of, of being able to speak about their past and their desires in, in, in a natural way. Yeah, well, you know, not everybody has a natural gift for public speaking. Mm-hmm. So for some, it can come off uh, rather easy, and for others, it's going to be that's going to be the hardest part, the hardest uh, piece of work in uh, getting into that next step uh, through the application process and into the interview. Um, it could take you know a couple hundred times. Repetition is the best thing. So mm-hmm. people need to really uh, um, take it seriously because you know you may think you got it, but until you go in front of somebody and start. Uh, promoting yourself, you're not really going to see uh, that outcome. Uh, it, may be, it may not sound as good as you think the first time, mm. but after a couple of times, it gets pretty easy. That's great. What about um, your thoughts about staying in the reserves and, and how you approach that or advice for listeners about how to think about whether or not to stay in the reserves? Well, you know, I had the fortune where uh, on the reserve side for me, I was technically active duty uh, the whole time. So I was getting all the benefits and uh, was basically an active duty person. I just happened to be a reservist um, uh, through those last 13 years. But I think, I think it's a good uh, fallback. You know, through the Employee Support of Garden Reserve, uh, you're, pro- you're protected uh, where you, know, you can come back uh, to your, op- to your uh, position and be able to uh, continue after you go back from your if you were mobilized or you know, even if it's a simple uh, weekend or your two-week active training. I think it's a good uh, nest egg for you too uh, because if you've committed that time, one of the things it does is uh, while you're on active, you're going to be able to maintain a clearance in case you're in, in between job uh, uh, opportunities if that were to happen to you. So you're able to keep that clearance going uh, and for people that are looking for defense contractor opportunities, like within my company with Lockheed Martin, that's a key uh, component for a lot of positions within our company. Another thing, too, is, is um, you know, after you do your full 20 years, you have that 20-year accountability, you'll be starting to receive that paycheck uh, uh, in your 60s. You know, it may not be something now, 
but is that future nest egg for the future? And I think that's something that, especially with today's economy and uh, you know, every little bit of money counts, I think that uh, that's a good benefit right there. Mm -hmm. Plus, you never know what type of additional uh, training opportunities or networking opportunities that you could identify or find for maybe future employment opportunities too. That's great. Um, I also wanted to ask, you know, obviously your, your title is military relations project manager. What does that mean? What do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, sometimes I wonder what I don't do. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I am part of a five person team uh, right now that is engaged in a lot of different activities. Uh, we have four of the five people are retired military. The other one had served in the military. So he's a veteran. Uh, we have uh, individuals that recruit um, in target areas in the central region, the western region, and uh, up here on the eastern region. And uh, we also have an individual that uh, does primary sourcing for us uh, after uh, the back end does. So those guys do about 190, 170, 190 uh, career fairs and other events over the uh, course of the year. Uh, I fill in on a couple areas. So my role is to work with the programs and partnerships uh, to identify ways of being able to improve uh, uh, how we identify people or the partnerships that can help us increase identifying that talent pipeline uh, and maybe even uh, be part of a task group uh, like one of the ones I'm a part of where we're talking about the uh, TAP classes and how to uh, collaborating with the Department of Labor and other like-minded companies to improve that process and provide uh, our insight from the outside looking in on how to do that. So uh, that's in a nutshell. Uh, what I do along with the rest of the team. Um, we are heavily engaged with talking to transitioning service members and uh, providing the best advice possible. You know, we've been there, we've worn the t-shirt, so we know how to uh, talk the talk and walk the walk because uh, we've all gone through the transition ourselves. So uh, that, that's pretty much uh, what we do and what I do as well. That's great. It is wild just to think when you said 170 to 190 career fairs per year, it's just an incredible volume. Um, it just kind of speaks to the amount of activity going on. Um, I'm wondering for veterans or people on active duty or even their spouses who are listening, why might um, a career at Lockheed Martin be um, a good fit for them? Well, you know, our old motto is we never forget who we're looking, uh, who we're working for. Our new one is uh, our mission is yours. So they both uh, kind of speak for itself. I mean, we're very in tune uh, as an organization with uh, our military community. One out of every five uh, employees on average uh, has served in the military or is currently serving for those guard and reserve, reservists that we have. Uh, and, you know, that, that's pretty significant considering we're a 105 plus thousand uh, employee uh, organization. Uh, we have military veteran uh, employee resource groups uh, that uh, from all business areas. And, you know, a lot of people are very familiar with our, uh, with, with the uh, what product that we put out uh, because they've worked on it themselves. So that's a natural fit for a lot of the military. Uh, and, you know, I think another thing that's very important, especially, you know, if you're not interested in Lockheed, that's fine. Um, the, you know, our philanthropic efforts. When you're giving back to the community and giving back to the military, it shows a lot to the dedication of what uh, our company does. Uh, you know, whether it's uh, working with the American Corporate Partnership, working with Hiring Our Heroes, uh, working with the Blue Star Families, uh, the Military Spouse Employment uh, Partnership, uh, you name it. Uh, we've got a lot of good uh, partnerships out there that uh, really show that we truly care about the military. And if you're a service member uh, looking for an organization that uh, you want to feel proud and be a part of, this truly is one of those to be part of. That's great. And for listeners, I'll add in links. We've had um, interviews with American corporate partners and hiring our heroes. I'll, I'll put those in the show notes for this episode so you can learn more about those as well as links for Blue Star Families. And I think it's great what your point to is 
uh, it, it seems like a sense of community of being able to fit in with like-minded people, people who have a similar background and similar values, but also feeling part of something bigger, which I know a lot of people mention they miss when they leave the military is being part of something with a, a bigger purpose. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, uh, a lot of people say, you know, hey, you know, I don't uh, mind calling my boss by their first name and knowing that I have a first name again. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, being able to talk about some things that may be familiar for you um, makes you feel at home. Uh, you know, you want to, no matter where you're at, you want to have that comfort zone, that comfort feel when you're within an organization. So if you've got somebody that, uh, you know, has uh, had similar experiences or even just, you know, served uh, for those transitioning service members, it kind of makes you feel at ease. And, you know, we do have, our uh, veteran employee resource group that gives us that opportunity to come together and uh, speak on that. I know that uh, uh, Chuck probably talked about that in his uh, uh, podcast uh, from a couple weeks ago. Uh, you know, and it's just exciting to see what we do. Uh, there's just so many things that uh, um, we as an organization uh, do for our military that uh, every day I'm learning something new. Mm. And I was excited to learn, I mean, you've had so much experience at Lockheed in your career, just seeing people in their transition and seeing veterans make that transition. I'm wondering what stands out to you? Is there anything that you've seen that, that veterans tend to do well or that they tend to make mistakes or anything that if you had a room full of, of military members, you'd say, hey, this is a couple things you need to know to really hit it out of the park in your civilian career. I think one of the biggest things, uh, and this isn't a knock, I mean, if you, anybody, until you get that monkey off your back and get that first paycheck and have that, uh, um, that new career uh, for you, uh, you're going to be nervous. And I think one of the biggest things that I see is don't show that sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people, they get very nervous. They, they could almost get somewhat soccerish uh, when it comes to emails or uh, you could hear it in their voice, either at events or over the phone, because, you know, it's not going fast enough for them. They need to understand that uh, the one thing in human resource uh, that's uh, constant in every company is uh, nobody's quick in HR in the hiring process. Mm -hmm. You know, that takes time. Uh, I think another thing, too, is that individuals need to um, understand that the resume is not a one-size-fits-all. Um, every application that you uh, have is going to be a different resume, uh, you know, because one bullet can make or break uh, you missing that, going into that next step. And I think, you know, the other thing, too, is it's not, uh, I hope this doesn't come off uh, too strong, but uh, you're not owed anything. Mm. Uh, you know, you serve a country, that's great, but every company is trying to find the best uh, candidate. And just because you've served and you've had that experience or that thing doesn't necessarily mean that you're the best candidate. So you need to be humble. You need to be able to uh, understand that, you know, there actually might be somebody better than you. And be prepared for that because um, rejection is hard when, uh, you know, you have, say you have 800 people applying for that one position. Uh, and you're vying for it. All we can do, um, especially uh, myself and the rest of the military relations team, there's a lot of people out there that are like this. Uh, identify that person that can at least help get your foot in the door to get your application reviewed. Um, you know, and work on a timeline. Be inquisitive, but don't be uh, somebody that is like uh, calling every day. You know, give yourself, you know, like, seven to ten days in between asking the person when would be a good time to call back goes a long way in uh, uh, showing that you understand and respect that person on the other end mm. there is uh, so much great about what you just said i want to take a moment and dive into a couple pieces I, I was thinking on that first part of the the movie swingers which i realize is a lot a lot older now, but uh, one of the characters gets the number of a girl and he's really excited and he just, you know, in this montage calls and leaves like 50 messages in the, in the course of a night. And that's what I was thinking of, of that over eagerness that no one finds appealing. And I like the context you sent for that, set for that, which is 
I can imagine that first paycheck, it's, it's a lot of pressure and you want to make sure that you're going to be taken care of. It's a big transition. You want to make sure that there's that continuity in your finances. And so finding some way to not have that bleed over to the employer and how off putting that can be if someone is trying to make their timeline, the company's timeline and not recognizing like, Hey, the, the company has its path. It has its timeline. It has its process. And you can't really change that even if your needs are great financially. So I loved that piece. And then I love that you said that, you know, I view it as entitlement and I think it's come up a lot on the show is a lot of people, myself included, you can leave the military with a sense of I did my service and therefore the, the, the country is going to take care of me or provide me with this great job. And like you said, employers value someone's service. Of course, they want to look out for them, but their obligation to their employees, to their investors, to their shareholders, their obligation is to find the best person for the job. And they're not going to compromise that just because someone served in the military. And I think what's great about that on the flip side is I don't think anyone listening wants to work for a company that's just compromising and lowering the standard to accept a veteran. They want to work for someone where they see the value they provide and they're excited and they realize they're the right fit for the right job. And hopefully that, that motivates them to find that. And it kind of goes back to your, your previous statement, like it takes time. It takes time to have all of these conversations and figure out where the timing is right, where the fit is right, where the community is right. There's a lot to get right in this, and that might take time. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's funny because myself and the rest of my team, we're always uh, trying to bet, improve that uh, better mousetrap, so to speak. You know, uh, we reach out to the hiring managers and lead recruiters because you know, there are times where we're strongly advocating for a person because we believe we found that perfect fit for them and they're not getting looked at. And sometimes there's some things that we don't even know. And, you know, we have to, you know, inquire, okay, what's missing here? What's that missing piece? And, uh, I mean, I, I don't think any one requisition has been the same. Uh, any one uh, uh, hiring manager has had the same process on how they select somebody uh, all we can do is make sure that we're um, mentoring as much, mentoring and coaching that uh, candidate as much as possible, and hopefully, all transitioning service members or job seekers out there uh, are uh, identifying somebody that can do that. You know, if they're able to identify somebody within the company that can give them at least a small edge, you know, if they can at least get their interview, uh, not their interview, their application uh, reviewed at least that piece um, is a big stepping uh, point forward in uh, the success of the transition process. Mm, that's great. What about, um, I always like to ask about resources and I'm wondering, are there any books or podcasts or conferences, uh, movies, anything that's made a difference in your career that you would pass on to listeners? Um, I think one big resource that's out right now for transitioning service members, if their command allows them the opportunity to do it, is to participate in a skill bridge program. Uh, the DOD skill bridge programs give them an opportunity while they're still on active duty to obtain an internship fellowship uh, within a uh, company um, uh, that like-minded and potentially their next career. Uh, Hiring Our Heroes uh, Corporate Fellowship Program has the best a program out there uh, where they have three cohorts and uh, gives an opportunity across 60 different regions uh, as of now, uh, or the respective service branches of uh, career skills programs. Uh, Lockheed Martin is very engaged with that. In fact, we've had 39 uh, people to date that have graduated from one variation or another of the DD Skill Bridge, uh, mostly being with the Hiring Our Heroes Corporate Fellowship Program. And we have 14 going through right now, and the next batch is going through. I've got about 17 or 18 that I'm working with right now. So th that's one of the main things I do, is I'm working with those individuals that are trying to transition out and be part of that uh, skill bridge opportunity. To me, it works so well because we're able to learn the culture of the company 
and start to acclimate into that and not get, have that rigid atmosphere, that direct uh, feel that you probably get in the military. Um, you're starting to see what's going on with the company. Uh, there's so many resources out there. Um, you know, ACP, the American Corporate Partnership, or Veterati, both of them are great mentorship uh, um, tools for that transitioning service member to kind of help them with the networking and things like that. Uh, a resource that we have within Lockheed Martin is Military Connect, which is an online talent community that where we created this transition plan of action to talk about the nine steps of uh, what we feel, me and the rest of the team felt uh, was uh, the process that somebody goes through within their transition, starting with, with the most inside they've gotten out all the way up to getting back and doing that payback. Uh, for the person after they found their opportunity and everything in between. Um, the uh, Resume Career Builder by Hiring Our Heroes uh, and uh, Toyota, um, it's called the Resume Engine. Um, that, that is another great tool because it gives you a great foundational resume builder out there. Um, that, to me, that's the best tool out there for resume building for somebody just starting out creating a, um, a resume because you're able to um, plug in your, your military occupational code, your rank, uh, and all your different service schools, and it'll translate into civilian uh, terminology uh, bullet points for you. Not the end all be all, but it is a great uh, resume uh, career builder start, so to speak. And for listeners, that, that, that is a fantastic list of resources at beyondtheuniform.org. I'll have links to all of these different things that David mentioned because these are all worth, worth checking out. And actually, a good portion of those I haven't heard of before. So that's, um, I think this will be a really- I, I could talk for days on it. Uh, <laughs> I really could because uh, that's the main piece of what I do. Mm -hmm. My company is identifying those resources that will uh, help transitioning service members that will um, help our team and our company um, and you know to also weed out to those uh, those resources that aren't uh, true resources mm. um, you know because that's that's something too unfortunately that's out there where you have certain resources out there that say that they're the veteran uh, um, they're, they're there for veterans they're doing the flag waving but they're really there just for the profit mm. uh, and that's something that I take just as serious when I'm out there identifying resources is flagging those uh, resources that aren't a, uh, um, what I would say questionable uh, in the way that approach that they have. There's a lot of replication out there too. So, you know, when I'm looking at uh, resources, cause you know, a lot of people are like, Hey, I'd like to partner with you, but if it, you know, we've already got a lot of name resources out there. And if it's not really adding any additional spokes to that wheel, it's really not something that I'm going to invest in. Or if they're like, hey, you know, we're out in this area. I'm like, hey, you know, I've got something that already covers that. Uh, although their intentions may be well, you know, we need to find something that has the best uh, ROI on our end. That's great. Um, I wanted to ask as well, if, if someone listening is interested in learning more about Lockheed Martin, what, what advice do you have for them about going deeper on this? Well, you know, the big thing is that they really, they need to, just like with any company, they need to go to our company website at www.lockheedmartin.com forward slash careers. Just surf, surf everything that you can about uh, what Lockheed Martin is about, not just on our website. Uh, look at our for our transitioning service members. We have a military careers uh, page that will uh, allow you to uh, utilize the uh, resume search and uh, the, the search engine, the uh, skills translator that we have on there, where you can plug in your military occupational code, and it'll hopefully give you a lot of opportunities on there. Understand that any. Uh, um, tool like that has a special algorithm so it's not, it doesn't always have a perfect fit um, but you know you do we do our best in trying to keep that updated um, you know and, and I think military connect that, that I've mentioned uh, previously is probably the best tool on there uh, because you can speak to one of either myself or one of the other uh, 
uh, military relations managers or one of the coaches, a, a, an external uh, or internal uh, employer that may match that person's skill set. Uh, so they could uh, reach out to that person, direct message that person, and say, hey, you know, uh, please don't ask for about a job opening or anything like that, but just inquire about, hey, what's a successful way of getting into uh, the company? I noticed that you had the same skill set as myself or a similar skill set, and what can I do uh, to reach out? Because I get a lot of people that continuously say, um, I need some assistance identifying a recruiter down in you know, XYZ area, and we're not gonna give it to you. Uh, that, that's like the secret sauce out there. You know, uh, you have the resource right there on the computer. Um, if the recruiters kept, or hiring managers kept getting hold of, uh, or the applicants kept getting hold of recruiters and hiring managers, they'd never be able to get their job done. Mm -hmm. So we have professionals like myself and the rest of the military relations team that offers that opportunity. We also offer a uh, military virtual chat session twice the twice a month on the first and third Monday of every month uh, between 1 and 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So you can connect with us as well. Um, it's for basic information. We're not going to be able to say, hey, yeah, you know, that, that career opportunity in uh, Orlando, yeah, let, let me uh, pull it up. Uh, it's not that easy. You can have anywhere from three up to 6,000 career opportunities open at any given time. And because you only have about 10 to 15 minutes with us per session, uh, it's really hard to um, signify that point and you know, let them know, hey, there's that out there. We can look things up. We can assist with applications. We can assist with um, providing that basic uh, advice on the application process or the best tips for applying to our company or any company and uh, get just a basic feel. Uh, so it kind of puts them in the right direction. That's great. And, and again, for listeners at beyondtheuniform.org, I'll have links to all of these different aspects, but I love that this, the skills translator, it seems like that's a great way. Like you said, it's not going to get everything perfect, but it's a good way to save yourself a lot of time and effort and get a good foundation that you can then tweak. And then the, the military virtual chat sessions, what a great way to just kind of get those quick questions answered and the military careers page to have those more one-on-one -on -one conversations. So I think it's, it's a, um, or the, I'm sorry, the military connect page. Um, it, you've got a very broad set of uh, value added tools that listeners can take advantage of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, we're always trying to evolve and uh, find uh, better ways to help the transitioning service members. Um, you know, the, the rest of the military relations team, uh, Jason, Tony, Charles, James, uh, Anthony, uh, Tony, James, Tony, no, we got so many, uh, Gilbert, Gilberto, uh, um, we're always trying to find different ways of um, improving how we reach out to our transitioning service members, improving ways of trying to um, help them in, in different ways. And it's not just you know, helping the hiring manager or identifying hiring managers and lead recruiters and doing that personal touch uh, with uh, that outreach with the requisition application that they've done, uh, but it's also identifying the programs where we can find that great time, like for the corporate fellowship program or promoting out to the different uh, transition offices across the country at the different bases um, hey, you know, here's a great opportunity for those skill bridge programs. Mm. Well, I always like to leave the last question open ended, and that is um, what have we not covered that you want to know, listeners to know, or what do you want to make sure they remember as we wrap up? You know, I think uh, everybody's transition is different. You know, there, I don't think there's one person, there's similarities in the transition process, but uh, not one is the same. I mean, everybody has their own circumstances. Sometimes it's about timing. When I first got out, we were at probably in 2009, we were at the highest unemployment rate for uh, veterans, which was over 12% uh, at the time. And now we're under 3.1%, um, depending upon what news, what source you read. Uh, so, you know, the opportunities are out there. I think you just need to be do, do, do diligent uh, because the job search is a 
a, a complete uh, 40 hour work week for you. Mm. Uh, you hit, it's, it's something that takes time. It's something that, I, that you shouldn't take lightly. I, you know, I, I think that uh, um, when you're transitioning out, just be prepared. You know, listen to all the advice and take what resonates with you. Mm. Well, David, thank you for taking the time to speak with our audience today. And also thank you for the work that you're doing at Lockheed Martin to help the military community. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Quick couple admin points. Um, we release brand new episodes every single Monday and Thursday. Those are usually recorded uh, about a month or so before they go live. Um, and um, every Monday and Thursday, we have an interview, usually almost always with a military veteran about their civilian career. More and more, we're starting to add in experts who may not be met veterans, but may have some expertise that will help the military veteran community. Um, Saturdays, I typically post more of a behind the scenes episode, which is a free form format. I try to use what I'm calling a mullet format. And by that, I mean business up front, party in the back, uh, talking through admin points, uh, professional topics related to the podcast. It might be a conversation I had that week. It might have been an interview I had that week, but just trying to, to share things that are top of mind that may help you in more of a free form, straight from the heart format. And then the party in the back is the personal side of things, just kind of more free flowing uh, thoughts on life, on um, uh, improving oneself, just kind of whatever's going on in life and trying to be authentic and um, honest about um, those things as well. Special thanks. We have an all volunteer army of people behind Beyond the Uniform making this possible. Uh, we do this on our lunch breaks, on our evenings, on our weekends, because we love the military community. We want to give back. We want to make a difference. We want that as part of the purpose in our life that we we valued in the military. Um, so special thanks to Steve Bain. Steve does pretty much everything. He helps uh, secure guests. He does our newsletter. He keeps the reels rolling and keeps me sane. Kathleen Dillon, the first person to join our team. She writes text transcripts of every single episode. It's wild. She keeps up with two of these a week despite a demanding career and education right now. Uh, but those transcripts help us get more SEO value, helps her audience more. Um, Andrew Woolridge is our data guru. He helps us understand the numbers, which is the easiest way for us to figure out how we can better support you and um, adds kind of the, the data oversight for that. Rick Healy does all of our social media. He is gaining more and more of an audience for us by getting our videos, getting our podcasts out on social channels. Um, the best way to stay in contact with us is if you go to beyondtheuniform.org, there is a newsletter. You'll have a little pop-up that comes up. You can put your email in. We email twice per month. We try to be respectful, but it is a great way to get uh, appraised of upcoming events, upcoming interviews, promos where companies are giving discounts to Beyond the Uniform listeners, and more. Uh, this does cost money to put on. We are um, uh, committed to not charging veterans directly, um, and the way that we kind of offset costs is through corporate sponsors. So if you know of a company that would like to get in front of a military audience and their families, uh, that's one way that we can both add value to our members but also offset the costs of Beyond the Uniform and give us a little bit of budget to start expanding what we're doing. So that's the, the best way you can help us. If that's not something that you can do, a positive review on iTunes is greatly appreciated. Have a wonderful week. We will be back Monday, Thursday, and Saturday with more interviews. And uh, yeah, keep up the, the, the listening. Take care.